Good morning, I'm Borodar Palp. I'm Oriel Miller, I'm the director of the IWA. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we are Wales' leading independent think tank with a long track record of shaping debates and influencing change in Wales through policy, research and advocacy. Our online and print publications, which provide platforms for robust comment and debate and our agenda setting events. We're a membership organisation with members across the country and far further afield. We're funded by our members, the events that we run ourselves and independent trusts and foundations. We're delighted to have so many of today's attendees uh, being our members joining us. For those of you who aren't, please do consider joining us. You can help make our projects happen, continue to deliver events such as this one and play your own part in making Wales better, which is our mission. A little bit of housekeeping before we get stuck in. As it's a webinar on Zoom, participants are muted by the host and we're going to use a Q&A section for questions. If you'd like to direct your question to a particular panellist, please do state their name. We also encourage you to engage with each other in the chat because we're still not able to meet up in person and please note that all chat and questions are recorded. The hashtag for today's event is hashtag IWA debate. So to today's event which is a chance to reflect on the 2021 Senate elections, what just happened, what happens next and what does this mean for the IWA and our partners priorities in the long term. So a little bit of a recap first. This was trailed as a historic election where anything could happen. Polls consistently showed Labour losing seats. The only question was where they would be and to whom. But in the, big, in the end, the biggest surprise was that there was no major surprise. Labour are reconfirmed as, as Professor Richard Wynne-Jones has put it, the National Party of Wales. The debate will no doubt rage for some time over what contributed to this win, but there can be little doubt that Mark Drakeford has proven himself to be a considerable electoral asset. Plaid Cymru support has fluctuated in different constituencies, but to little net effect in terms of seats. Applied First Minister still, still seems a distant prospect. What does this tell us about their strategy of putting independence front and centre? The Welsh Conservatives can tell a less ambiguous success story as they achieve their best ever results. But they can only be disappointed that the UK Conservatives' gains in Wales in the 2019 Westminster general election have not translated into Senate success for them. For the smaller parties, it's been a near wipeout. UKIP and their various successor parties are gone. No seats for abolish or for the Wales Green Party. The Lib Dems' Jane Dodds is now the only MS not from the big three parties. So where does this leave us? It's fair to say that the election team and many of our partners were all set for an extended post-election period. Perhaps this event would be taking place as we were still waiting for the white smoke of applied Labour deal to emerge, maybe even a formal coalition, one Wales two. In the end, Mark Drakeford no longer needs such an arrangement to govern, but has spoken of his willingness to reach out to other parties and his desire for stable progressive government. So it's fair to, to assume Plaid and the Lib Dems may yet wield some influence over the next five years with a government that doesn't quite have the comfort of a majority. The Senate has 20 new MSs, including one returner, with 17 of them on the opposition benches. That's over half the opposition brand new on the job. Only one opposition MS, Plaid's Ellen Jones, now the Slowith again, has any experience of government. They face a strengthened Labour government, which put continuity at the heart of its campaign and was rewarded with an increase of one seat and an increase in its mandate. At the IWA, our job is to look for ways to make Wales better. Regardless how all of us vote, IWA staff and indeed all of us here today, no party has the monopoly on good ideas, no manifesto is without its gaps and no government will be perfect on delivery. So we should always be looking for both the big transformative ideas as well as constructive ways to tweak, course correct and build on Wales's successes, whoever is in government. Many of you in our audience today will be asking the same questions that we are. Where is the political space in the next Senate to push the Welsh Government further on the changes we want to see? Things that may not have featured in Labour's fairly streamlined and pragmatic manifesto. Today, we'll take a moment to reflect a little more on the, on the election results, what happened and why, what have we learned about, about what people in Wales want. Then we'll turn to what comes next for Wales, for the Welsh Government and for devolution itself. So I'm delighted to introduce our panel. 
Laura McAllister is Professor of Public Policy in the Governance of Wales, Wales Governance Centre. She's an IWA trustee and a mainstay of panel discussions on Welsh politics. You'll have seen her a lot on the telly over the last week commenting on the elections. So thank you for keeping going for us, Laura. Rocio Cifuentes is Chief Executive at EAST, the Ethnic Youth Minority Support Team. It's an organisation which, amongst other things, supports people from minority ethnic backgrounds to find roots into public life and political participation. Rocio is also an Honorary Life Fellow of the IWA in recognition of her work to improve diversity in public life. And we're delighted to showcase articles from two EAST staff in the newest edition of the Welsh Agenda out this week and a copy which should be with you if you're already a member. We're also joined by the IWA's very own Andy Regan, who oversees all of our policy projects and influencing work. He's written his own introduction and just wanted me to mention that after the election, he felt quite tired. Thank you, Andy. Um, so we're going to keep lots of questions, uh, lots of time for questions to our panel from everybody here today. So please get thinking and submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of, our sc of your screen and via the chat box where our moderator, Harry Thompson, will pick them up. So first, let's, let's hear from our panelists. So we're thinking about what just happened. Obvious question, why did Labour win this election? Laura, can we come to you first, please? Uh, yes, Borida uh, Oriel, Borida Paub. Um, gosh, that's a really big question, but I think in the interest of time, I can give quite a simple answer. I think it's because Labour knows how to win elections. Um, they've had enough practice and they've had enough success over the past century to really hone their ability to translate uh, votes into seats in places where it matters. Um, they're nimble, they're able to adjust uh, according to the level of election that they face. Um, as, as we said, I think in the BBC cover coverage, they, they fight the contest that's ahead of them rather than the contest they'd like to fight, which I'm afraid can't be said for some of the opposition parties. There's also the issue of context in this election, for sure. Um, you know, people talk about luck, but I, I, I think that's a little bit um, churlish, especially in an election that came right at the end of probably one of the most difficult periods our nation has faced with COVID. But certainly in the cycle of COVID, the election came at the right time for Labour, um, not at a period of start of lockdown, but at a period of successful rollout of the vaccination programme. Um, and then I guess the other thing I'd say is just the credibility and authenticity of the First Minister himself. Um, a kind of unexpected gift to Welsh Labour, if we're being entirely honest, because if you'd talked to us maybe 16, 18 months ago, uh, not many of the Welsh population would have real recognition of Mark Drakeford, and they certainly would then not have been able to judge his competence or his delivery. Whereas, of course, after this period, after this past 13 months, most people have a view on the Welsh Government's competence and their handling of COVID. And moreover, that verdict is generally positive, as all of our polling shows. So Mark Drakeford became an electoral asset. He became somebody that people wanted to speak to um, in his walkabouts and latterly when they, the parties were able to canvass. And I think that was an unexpected addition to um, the campaign. And then finally, because I know others will have other views, it, it, you can't ignore incumbency. You know, in a delivery election, a low key election, an election where people were effectively being asked to validate their government's handling of a public health crisis, then clearly incumbency plays well. Um, if you put all of those factors together, I think that gives you an indication of why Labour did so well. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. You know, so. So, Rossio, we've talked about Mark Drake's increased profile and people liking what they saw because of um, because of having seen him more often on the telly and also the handling and the difference in how Wales handled the pandemic. Running a strong ground campaign and that message rooted in delivery and promises kept. We still had we still had low turnout, though, didn't we, in, in lots of the Labour one seats amongst the communities that you that you work with. Did you feel that and um, hear that more people were getting involved in, in the elections. Uh, thank you, Ariel. Um, yeah, I, I yes. Um, I think there was certainly um, 
there was more effort made from most of the political most of the mainstream political parties in this election um, than I've seen previously. So more, there was more effort to target uh, and engage minority ethnic people in this election. And there was more effort made to talk, start to look at issues of representation of candidates. Um, but I do feel that the effort was probably too little too late. It, it really took off, you know, on the back of the Black Lives Matters this, um, movement. And um, it, despite the effort that there is, there is very, there is still um, lack of lack of turnout and lack of engagement amongst minority ethnic communities and including amongst minority ethnic young people. And, you know, we know that turnout amongst young people is still uh, much, much lower than we would like it to be, um, despite the, you know, the historic uh, enfranchisement of 16 and 17 year olds. So I feel like the parties did start to do, try to do a lot more, but it felt quite last minute. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of candidate representation, you know, the, the, the diversity of candidates was not there, unfortunately, for this election. Um, we hope that it would be for the next one and possibly for local authority elections. Um, but I would agree with Laura's comments on, on why Labour won. Uh, I think um, in Wales, it, yeah, it, well, everywhere, it was, it, was, it was a very much a COVID election. And people but definitely saw the distinction between Mark Drakeford's um, more safe and slow approach compared and contrasted to, to the UK governments. And I think more than that, I, 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 I would like to think that the values um, demonstrated by Mark Drakeford's leadership of more traditional, maybe more socialist, more openly socialist values um, I think overall resonated more still and resonate more and still reflect perhaps more the values of Wales um, than the than you know what the other parties had to offer. Mm -hmm. Let's come let's come back to the issues of representation in a minute because I think there's quite a lot more to go into there. But I'm going to come to you, Andy, in terms of turnout. You know, we're still bumping along one percentage point higher than than the last time around in 2016. Um, we, you know, so it's, it's not it's not where we want it to be. And also, you know, how Brexit played into this, did it? Should we, you know, might we've expected to see more of a Boris bounce? You know, vaccination is 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 the tricky thing because it's it's uh, UK wide, but it's also been handled and run effectively well in 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 Wales. What were you surprised by? Um, I mean, personally, I, I was surprised about how much of an electoral asset Mark Drakeford kind of proved to be compared to how I was feeling about him during the, the Labour leadership election at the time. I mean, I'm not a, not a Labour member, didn't have a vote in that election, but I didn't kind of anticipate him being somebody who would really kind of cut through to people in any context. But obviously, or no, nobody saw kind of COVID come in. So I'm you know, quite happy to sort of say I was I was wrong about that. Um, I was also, uh, towards the end of last year, I was concerned that we were actually going to have a very different election. I think Laura's right, this, this did become an election about delivery. I saw hints then that we were going to have potentially quite a divisive campaign, quite a kind of populist campaign, I've seen some hints of that. But in the end, I think we, we saw what we normally see, which is, you know, there's quite a big consensus within Welsh politics, looking at the three big parties' manifestos, you could quite easily have copy and pasted you know, huge chunks between those three manifestos and nobody would have noticed the kind of policy space is very, very similar. So in terms of turnout, like what's positive to me in terms of like a quite kind of calm, you know, let's say boring election about policy and delivery, um, is perhaps not that exciting for people, you know, people who are le less engaged and have their kind of face pressed up against the shop window of Welsh politics day in, day in, day out. That may have something to do with, with, with turnout again. Um, in the long term, in terms of Brexit, I guess the interesting thing will, to, will be to see whether 20, the 2016 election was a kind of Brexit blip and this election is things being back to normal or whether actually this election is a COVID blip on a kind of long term kind of Brexit trend and uh, you know, trend in, in terms of growth and support for Welsh Conservatives. And you know, obviously we'll have to do this event again in five years to see how that plays out. No doubt, no doubt we shall. So let's come back, Laura, then to the to the next big questions, which are about um, some of the other parties. So abol abol very difficult to say abolitionist parties returned zero seats. 
support for independence didn't translate into support for Plaid, and we'll come back to what that means for Wales's constitutional future a bit later on. The Conservatives took quite a hard line on, on no new powers, and Labour's manifesto mentioned federalism and increases in powers over justice and uh, in particular. So, you know, whatever else drove the result, was this a vote for devolution? And is it the end for both Indy and Abolish? Well, uh, it wasn't a, uh, an election focused on constitutional issues. Let's start with that point. Um, where constitutional issues featured, it was mainly as a lens for more mundane public policy, you know, such as delivery around COVID and economic recovery and so on. But that's not to say that constitutional matters won't feature front and centre during this Senate term. I think they will mainly not because what's happening in Wales, but because what's happening in, in Scotland. And therefore, the Welsh Government will need to be part of that discussion and that discourse. Um, and therefore, I think some of the conversations that have already been going on within Welsh Labour around, you know, you, you can take your pick from the language, home rule, if you listen to Mark Drakeford, radical federalism, if you listen to Mick, Mick Antonyv and, and co., um, and some people, of course, who are, you know, more than indie curious within Welsh Labour. But but it wasn't an independence referendum. And I think there's always a danger, sorry, independence election. There's always a danger, I think, when um, all of us who do have our noses pressed against the glass of Welsh politics, as Andy beautifully put it, sometimes we forget that most people are not thinking in these terms. You know, I don't think this was ever going to be a referendum on the constitutional future of Wales. It was always going to be a judgment on public policy handling during COVID and the credibility of Welsh Labour. And, you know, let's be fair, uh, sorry to go back to the previous answer, but I think we missed out one really fundamental thing there, which is the trust, the inherent trust that the Welsh people have in Welsh Labour. And that goes back, you know, more than a century. It's, it's a bit like supporting a football team and, and loving them, but hating them at the same time, you know, when you fall out of love with them when they've, you know, they've sold all their best players or been taken over by foreign owners. But deep down, you're, you know, many people in Wales are still supporting that team. And significantly, and I think Matt Greenoff, who is previously uh, Carwin Jones' uh, senior spad, said the same thing, which is Labour didn't have to convert people. They just had to persuade them to come back. And that's a really different task to what the Conservatives and Plaid did. And by the way, you know, people talk about the Conservatives and say, oh, Andrew R.T. Davis's strategy was this 75% strategy. Let's, let's get 75% of our voters from the 2019 general election, UK general election, to come out and, and vote for us. If we get that, it'll be enough to win. But that was a stra strategy designed and destined to fail because... You know, people vote differently between two, those two sets of elections and turnout is different. And we know conservative turnout is even more um, impacted by a Senate election. So, so that, you know, so I'm just kind of contextualizing it by that. I mean, the abolish side, you know, I mean, it's difficult. Look, abolish, the arguments for abolishing the Senate might not go away completely, but I think they, if they stay, they'll be reformulated. Because, you know, in all the polling, almost the same number of Welsh people express a desire to get rid of the Senedd as want full independence for Wales. Mm. Um, so if you've got, you know, in polling between 20 and 28 percent of people saying we would be happy to get rid of the Senedd and then only under 4 percent actually voting for abolish. Admittedly, there were other parties standing on similar platforms. What it shows really is that people still believe that position, but they can't be bothered to go out and vote or they don't feel they should vote because they're endorsing the institution. So we've got to be a bit cautious. You know, this. some people have issued grand statements such as this is the end of the abolitionists, you know, that it, it, they won't be back in 2021. Well, I, I, you know, be careful about that because, you know, there is a, still a body and there's likely to remain a body because of the demographics of Wales who simply are anti-devolution. That will fade over time because it's age related but, but it could still be a prominent feature in the 2026 elections. So I guess one of the questions then is, you know, we might have expected far more people to have turned out because of it being a COVID election, Laura, but we didn't, we didn't see that. You know, so there's one thing, and I've seen also, you know, quite a lot more commentary on the voting system as well, and, and how, particularly how the regional votes are um, apportioned. So those are, those, those two things, were the kind of 
the voting system obviously is up for grabs and we'll come to we'll talk about that in terms of the next the sixth senate but turnout how do we crack how do we crack that turnout i mean i've spoken to people who said you know i, I it, it's not an, it's not an important election it doesn't it doesn't affect it doesn't affect me and you're thinking well if you don't if you don't see how that affects you this year of all years in terms of what you can do who where you can go who you can spend time with at the most basic level what more do we need to be doing to, to cut through to people? Yes, well, we need to be doing a lot more, um, but, but I think this has to be almost generational. You know, we, we, I've said enough in the past week, you know, Wales is not Scotland. We didn't have a public debate about devolution prior to 1997 and the referendum, and we've suffered from low legitimacy and low engagement throughout devolution right up until the time of COVID. Um, so, you know, let's just be realistic here. You know, this is generational. I don't think we're, that we're ever going to really convert big chunks of the population to be um, engaged with devolution in a way some of us would like. But I think you can start with young people. And again, you know, I hope that nobody judges when we've got raw data and we can look more forensically at the number of 16 and 17 year olds and 18 to 25 year olds who voted in the Senate election and, and work out some patterns there. I hope nobody rushes to judgments here because, you know, the, the idea of bringing in votes at 16 was predicated on a very different context and aligned with a very different educational offer none of which we've been able to really manage over the past 16 months. Now, I'm not making excuses here. You know, I mean, I, it, it's, I'm, I would support votes at 16 without any of those caveats. But nevertheless, I think we've got to see this as a generational change. We know that younger people have only grown up with devolution and they are generally more supportive of not only the institution, but more powers. But the Senate has got some work to do, and indeed Welsh Government, to actually reach out and convince people of its relevance and viability other than in a crisis because it's not enough to just be to just have that traction because you're dealing with a pandemic and a public health crisis you know there's got to be more onus on convincing people of the centers relevance outside those areas so let's thanks laura let's come to you rossio um young people turning out um we had just under 50% I think of 16 and 17 year olds registering to vote at the first time for the first time and few of them um, actually voting. Was there a sense of excitement about among the young people that the East supports? You know, what were the conversations like? Yes and no. Um, I, I think it's a real shame that this uh, elections uh, tend to be always during sort of ex school and university exam periods. So that's a really big issue because a lot of young people are really stressed and busy with school and university assessments. So ideally it would not, it would be in a non-exam non period. Um, people, some young people were excited, but I think it I, goes back to what Laura is saying that this really, we need to do much better with um, educating young people from a very, from a much younger age about how the political system works in Wales and in the UK. And I would like to see political and citizen education become mandatory within the new curriculum. We have a huge opportunity in the new curriculum and I don't feel that that opportunity has been effectively aligned with the, with the, with the change to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote. It, it should be common sense that of course we need to educate young people from, from primary ages about how, how, to, how, how democracy works, how to be a good citizen, how to, um, you know, to, to, to show leaders what your wishes are and how to ha have that influence policies and practices. And I think without that, we're all, people are always going to be kind of voting in a vacuum or not voting in a, in a, in a vacuum. So it, it's, a, it's a really important issue that I would like um, Welsh Government through its education and through its new curriculum to really grapple with and, and, and implement that change. And lots of people have been calling it for a long time. Um, and just really briefly to mention the, the, your question about um, the abolitionist um, parties, mm. I fear that we, we are giving that issue too much attention, more attention than, um, than the votes that re the, the parties received um, suggest it deserves, in contrast to really serious issues like climate change, and if you look at the, part, the, the votes for you know, green parties and so on, it's not equal. So um, there's a danger that we are 
kind of stoke in these fires more just by talking about it so much. And the BBC um, debate, for example, was 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 widely criticised from well was criticised maybe not widely, but I you know I question that decision. Um, but young people. There is still, it's, it's, you know, it, I would love to say to say that yes, there's huge appetite to really get engaged, but it's, it's, it has been quite difficult, and some young people just don't have any understanding of, you know, just the, the, the starting point for their levels of understanding about politics and systems and how it all works is really, really low, and even that, you know, that goes. It's not just young people. I think hardly anybody understands the, you know, how the regional vote system works even probably people on this panel, and I would struggle to explain it, if I'm honest. So, you know, that, that shouldn't be the case. We need to have a, a system which people can understand if we want democracy to work effectively. So one of the, one of the things that did, um, did get quite a lot of traction, certainly on Twitter, was the Children's Commission, a parallel vote, project vote, getting, I think they were 18 to 11 to 8 to 17 year olds, something like that. Um, and we'd have a very different Senate if, if we'd come up with, that, um, with their results too. But I think you're right, sort of the, the normal stuff, that you, the normal conversations about um, votes and elections, haven't been happening in schools because a well COVID for the, for the first point, and then this timing, this sinking, this sinking issue in terms of where the where the um, where the education process is and curriculum reform and and actual voting. Interesting about that issue about the timing of the election itself is a very good point, which you tend to forget when you don't have children taking exams. Um, but I think there, Andy, yeah. Yeah, just to jump in with a, re a really quick point about en engagement, I, I think there's there's something about how you how you frame the the question of getting people involved in in politics because I think if you take it if you kind of go to somebody and say are you interested in politics a lot of people will say no it's not for me I don't understand it and they're picturing probably lots of white men in suits shouting at each other I think the way to approach it is you start with what people are already interested in and then make them realize that that actually that is politics so they are interested in politics it's just there's a gap to be bridged between them and what what yeah. politics is portrayed as and I think, you know, just to sort of big up some IWA priorities um, from our recent documents, we, you know, we've been talking about the need to, for this engagement to go beyond just Senate elections every five years. You know, 16 year olds who have just voted for the first time shouldn't be their next chance to feel involved in politics, shouldn't be in, you know, in five years from now. So there's things like, you know, getting people involved in, in advance of local government elections next year, better resourcing coming in from Welsh government for, you know, participatory budgeting and things like that at local government level and at town and community council levels, you know, more kind of resources for develop, developing those functions, which are, you know, good places for people to get involved in democracy at a really local level and, you know, where they can see what politics means for their community directly. Yeah, thank you for, for reinforcing that. Rossio, can I just come back to you? Because we've now got three MSs from ethnic minority backgrounds, same as we had in the last, in the last Senate, but we've got our first woman of colour uh, MS, which is, you know, something to celebrate, but not necessarily great progress, really. No, yeah, no, so we've, gone from, we've gone from three to three. So, um, I mean, that translates to 5%. So it's not far off the, the um, po population uh, proportion, yeah. the demographic, yes. Um, but, you know, we, we should be doing much better than that, really, if we look at the, the, the demographic of, of young people in, in Wales, the, the growing ethnic minority population, <laughs> and um, parties need to be doing better. You know, they, they, they should be looking at implementing diversity quotas similar to the gender quotas that they already have. They should be looking to um, use the positive action, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the positive action um, powers of the Equality Act to full effect so that they, they should be recognizing that it's not a level playing field currently and that they need to be take more targeted and proactive action if they want to see any change because otherwise we'll just um, continue the status quo and it's it's far from where we would like to be um, you know the number the proportion of women has gone down yep so that's it's not progress at all it's you know we're just about treading water but possibly being dragged backwards at the same time and I think one of the 
Laura, Sorry, yeah. Maria, I was just going to jump in there because I agree with Rocky. I think I think the problem for me, if you stand back from all of this, is that we're trying to deal with micro issues without having a strategic view of how these could be addressed uh, in tandem. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, we celebrate um, Natasha Ashkar's arrival, of course, you know, as the first woman of colour. But we but we congratulate ourselves for too long on these things because, you know, it's simply not good enough that she is the first woman of colour to be elected to the Senate after 21 years of devolution. And, and I think we've got to join up the pieces here. We will not have a diverse Senate until the Senate is bigger um, because it's almost impossible to engineer this um, with a tiny, tiny Senate as we currently have. We will not have fair voting or better turnout until we change the electoral system, which is which is so dysfunctional now. I mean, I banged on about this all the way through the BBC coverage, but you know, no, no one understands how regional list seats are allocated, you know, except those of us who work daily in this area. And that is a fundamental democratic deficit. Because you know, if you take um, Labour's vote in the three southern regions, you know, they took they picked up almost a third of the regional list seat vote and gained no seats and nor could they ever gain seats whilst they do so well in the constituencies so all of those votes were completely wasted as i said people may as well have folded up their ballot paper and stuck it straight in the bin because that was never going to generate a single impact and so it, we need to connect up diversity size of the assembly size of the senate um, electoral system and quotas because we will never protect gender equality or indeed make inroads into BAME uh, diversity unless we have short term quotas. Um, all the evidence out there proves that. Um, so either we address these things in a strategic way or we do, a, you know, keep patting ourselves on the back when we make a tiny, tiny breakthrough or an unsustainable breakthrough, like when we've had over 50 percent women and then fallen back again. Let's come, let's come back to that in terms of the constitutional questions and, and the Senate questions in the, um, when we turn to what next. But first of all, Andy, I'm going to come to you in terms of, in terms of what next. You know, Labour have got an increased mandate and a strengthened position. Mark Drakeford could well decide to stay put, actually, rather than, rather than step down as, as FM. He's going to be naming his cabinet today, um, we understand. Tell us about the highlights of their manifestos. Can we expect anything radical? It's, it's interesting because the, the most radical thing I've noticed in the last few days, um, that, and I, I checked again this morning to make sure I hadn't missed it, but Mark Drakeford in his opening speech as First Minister mentioned universal basic income, which he's, is not, unless I've missed it, in the Labour manifesto, but he has spoken in previous FMQ sessions to Leanne Wood and I think Jan, Jack Sargent, he's given positive answers about support for that. So that'll be really interesting in, in terms of whether that is something that happens and what it looks like. He's, he's talked, if I'm remembering rightly, about trials on a kind of sectoral basis rather than a geographic basis for trials, which obviously isn't universal basic income, but you know, there's very little argument against giving people who need more money, more money. Um, so it'd be positive to see how that plays out. In terms of the, the, the things that you know, we're, we're probably going to be looking at from Labour's manifesto, there's obviously a massive commitment on decarbonisation of homes and linking that to economic stimulus. I think that the emphasis there should not just be on kind of making that an ambition for homes within Wales, but really the long term goal should be that uh, Wales, you know, companies rooted in Wales are building England's low carbon homes and Scotland's low carbon homes because there's going to be huge demand for that. So we shouldn't just be looking with, within our own borders for that. Um, that ambition. Um, there's a commitment to green infrastructure, which means we're going to have to get serious about looking at the, you know, the energy grid, amongst other things, which we've talked about before. Um, some of the energy ambitions around, you know, green jobs, um, it's going to need to modernise some of the functions that the Welsh Government are offering at the moment, like the energy service, you know, it needs to be probably be a bit revamped and more focused on kind of digital aspects of the energy market and tomorrow's energy market. You know, uh, I, I, as you know, I can talk about energy for the rest of the, the session, so I'll, I'll try not to, but you know, the, you. the energy market in the future is going to look very difficult, uh, very, very different, sorry, it's going to be more about flexibility and services, not just volume sales, and I'm, I'm still not totally persuaded that Welsh Government gets that. Um, it's been interesting to see the talked about a tidal lagoon challenge, um, you know, the, the, the project that, that's kind of hugely kind of politically popular, but very difficult to kind of deliver in, in, the, in the current devolved and, un, and, and reserved context. Um, 
where my kind of more radicalism I think should come from uh, is, re is really just following on from what Laura's just said more about the kind of the democratic side of it you know Mark Drakeford is back with a, with a huge mandate uh, you know as a unionist as a, as a federalist um, he said again in his opening speech it's his job to stand up for Wales and talked about being a constructive partner to to the UK government whether that um, you know whether that will be reciprocated it, it will be interesting but I think what what I kind of like to see from from Mark Drakeford and would have liked to see from any, any new first minister um, would be being a more visible advocate within the UK for Wales, Wales's role in the UK and you know does he see it as his role to leverage his position and his new mandate to make the case for devolution and make the case for you know his, his wider agenda um, there are huge barriers coming for the, the, the Labour Party's manifesto in the form of the Internal Market Act. It you know, potentially rules out anything from the, the ban on single use plastics to lots of the ambitions around uh, energy projects in, in Wales. Um, and it goes against the mandate he's just won. And it's also not something that was, was set out within you know, the, the UK Conservative Party's manifesto. And it's hugely troubling from a, a kind of pro-devolution point of view. So is Mark Drakeford going to kind of try and leverage his position in the way that Nicola Sturgeon does to sort of shape discourse UK-wide? Um, my, my kind of instinct on what he's like as a, as a person is that that's not the natural space he'll put himself into he's not going to turn into kind of Billy Big Boots but I would like to see him try and you know live Rich's position to make the positive faith case for, for devolution especially given that there's you know an ongoing conversation about what devolution in, Eng in England looks like and part of that has to be the electoral reform agenda that, that Laura's mentioned with all of the kind of moral reasons why that's the right thing to do having more votes count having better representation within within the senate and a more rational and fair um, electoral system so i hope kind of the labor commitment to build on the work of the senate committee on electoral reform you know endorses those recommendations if uh, as a starting point thanks andy i'm going to come back to you laura in terms of how likely you think that is to happen and then i've got one more question for you, you rossio before we open up because there's been loads of questions in the in the chat how likely do you think it is that mark drape is going to play a bigger a bigger role on that on that particular stage laura well i don't know is the obvious answer um but if not now then when is the is a better response really because you know there's a couple of things to take into account here you know, Labour, Welsh Labour should be emboldened by having the mandate that they have for um, for the sixth Senev. Clearly, this is going to be a Senev of parts. We're going to be looking at the handling of COVID as we ease out of the pandemic, rebuilding and so on, which is not going to be dealt with in one Senev term. But there is going to be a moment at which the, the First Minister and the Welsh Government will want to look longer term. And, and there's a legacy opportunity as well, isn't there, for Mark Drakeford? You know, if he does leave some at some point um, during this Senev as planned, then he will want to have something constructive and positive that he has achieved other than handling a COVID pandemic very well. And I think um, increasing the size of the Senate is probably one of the things that will feature in that conversation. I always smile when people kind of say, it'll never happen, you know, and by the way, it's always men who say this, especially because, you know, I think they think women who work in politics are somehow glibly naive and don't realize how politics works. It's always, if I get this once, you know, I've had this a million times, it won't happen. Why would Labour, Turkey's voting for Christmas, so on and so forth. Well, look, you know, this is going to have to change at some point. Um, and it's not about electoral system, by the way. It's about size. It's about delivery for the Welsh people because the Senate is underpowered and under-resourced. Electoral system change comes in because we need to alter the size of the Senate. And we can't um, enlarge the Senate without addressing the issue of the electoral system. And quite frankly, this election, yet again, has shown how dysfunctional the additional member system is. So if we accept that, and I think there is widespread acceptance of that now, then we would not wish to model out a system of AMS for an enlarged uh, Senev. So therein comes the opportunity. You see my, the links here. Therein comes an opportunity for electoral system change. Therein comes the opportunity for um, prescriptive legislative quotas for diversity. And you know, quite frankly, if somebody like Mark Drakeford um, aided and abetted and supported by a passionate advocate uh, of this, like Jane Hutt, isn't able to do this during the Senate, then I think we can give up on any rational, realistic modelling of the Senate to work for the people of Wales. It's as simple as that. 
So that that is a fairly top tip for everybody to be watching over the next over the next five years in terms of in terms of progress and some sequencing there that is that is needs to be carefully done. Rocio, um, just want to talk with uh, with you about uh, Welsh Labour's commitments to race and equality in terms of how happy are you with what what you saw in their manifesto and what would you like to see more of or further and faster? Uh, I I'm wondering if my um, I think I think I've got a wobbly Wi-Fi. Yeah, um, I think the point's been made already about how similar the content of the three mainstream parties um, manifestos was uh, and, and, and in terms of race commitments to race equality and diversity, they, they were they were relatively similar. Um, I think the the you know the proof is in the pudding, and so the big gap that we're constantly seeing is the implementation gap. So we've we've seen you know we've heard so many fine words, the promises, commitments for decades now, and so I think the the question is how are those how how is this um, this government planning to hold itself to account and enable its constituents you know, the, the people who voted for, for it and everybody who lives in Wales to hold them to account. So what are the mechanisms for scrutiny, for accountability, for transparency? Democracy isn't something that just happens once every five years. It should be an ongoing process. And I would like to just to see real clarity in terms of how Welsh, you know, how Mark Drakeford's government would like and, and is inviting um, citizens of Wales to take part actively in that process. So it's an ongoing so, thing. Go on, Aria. Yeah. Okay. So so I'm going to turn to questions from, from everybody on the webinar. They're coming in thick and fast. And let's hope we get through as many as possible. The question, first of all, from Catherine Fuchs from When Wales Women's Equality Network, which is given everything you've just talked about, Rocio and Laura, how can we collectively convince the sixth senate to adopt legally binding gender and diversity quotas? Laura. Well, you know, we, we've done a lot of work on this already, haven't we? So I don't think there's a need for more um, research and evidence. You know, the expert panel report has a long chapter um, and we go into some detail in that about why diversity can't be achieved without um, a framework, a legislative protected framework. Um, so I think we need to hold people to account. And the, danger, the problem we have with this is that we don't have a Senate with sufficient scrutiny capacity to hold government to account and back to my original point but i think maybe this is one for civic society you know every time somebody tells us something about diversity or even congratulates themselves on electing more women or more people of color then we need to um hold them to account and say but that's simply not good enough you know it, it's not as far as um we want the senate to become in terms of its diversity profile and the only way we can ever protect and make that sustainable and durable is if we introduce legislative change. So, you know, for me, it's as simple as that. I mean, I, I, I feel like I've been banging my head against a brick wall on this for a long time. So maybe I'm just tired and frustrated, but you know, there's only so many, so many ways you can present this really. The evidence is there. If you believe in diversity and equality and in, inclusion, then here's your evidence, quite frankly. We, when we worked as an expert panel, we received no counter arguments to um, the structures for improving diversity other than from people who didn't believe in diversity. That's fine. If you don't believe in diversity, great, you know, plow your own furrow. But if you do, you need to think concretely about how you might engineer improvements. Thanks. Uh, Rossio, do you want to add anything? Because if not, I've got, a, I've got another question for you straight away. I think Laura's covered it. I think it just, we just need, they, they, they need to take action and act on the evidence that's been presented. Okay, so there's a question here from Vivian Sugar. Um, the Senate is seen by many as very Cardiff focused and in need of better connection with communities right across Wales. What can it do to reconnect? It's done quite a lot of engagement, sort of they've got a quite active outreach team. What do you think would work well? Um, I would start with, with, with schools and increasing that outreach to schools and, and mandating schools to take up the offers. I, I know that schools 
I hear, you know, that they often feel overwhelmed by different agencies coming and offering different workshops and, and so on, which I can understand, but it, it, if it was mandated, structured, systematic, built into the curriculum, then that would be a much better way of helping young people understand from an early age what the CENIV is, how it works, you know, how they can engage with it. Uh, so I would really start there. Okay, um, Andy. Do you think, uh, there's an anonymous question here, do you think that the, the successful vaccine rollout and particular circumstances around COVID more generally might mask some deeper problems that Welsh Labour may face in the future? Um, I mean, it's, it's a tricky one without knowing what the kind of deeper problems that the, the, the questions are alluding to. I think it, it's certainly the case. So thinking about it from a, you know, as, as as we mentioned earlier, that like a third sector perspective, where our you know our job day in day out is finding ways that Welsh government can do a better job. We talk and talk and talk about the delivery gap and the, and the you know issues with the kind of capacity of the Welsh civil service to deliver the kind of policy ambitions of the government. So, you know, it's a very very mixed picture of what Welsh government and Welsh Labour have delivered over over twenty something years. Um, we all talk about the delivery gap. I think the delivery the, uh, issue that mattered in this election as has been said to death, was, was COVID and the response to COVID, and that will can only have helped them. So the short, the short answer is, is yes, but without kind of um, being clear about what the deeper questions are that are alluded to, I, I can't give a more specific can answer. Can I come in there, um, Aureal? Oh, I, think, yeah. I, I, I think that's a really fair question, um, because there's always a danger when you've had a great win that you forget, um, you know, that you might have easily lost that game in a different context. Um, and I think there's two things to say about the dangers that Labour faces. One is about its own renewal. It's very hard to renew and refresh when you're in government. And, you know, Welsh Labour hasn't had a break from government, in fairness to it. So I think that whole renewal process takes uh, is, is more constrained whilst it's in government. I think whilst it's been able to renew some of its personnel at elite level, that is candidates likely to win seats, the party is nowhere near the mass party that it was even two decades ago, never mind four or five decades ago. It's helped by the fact it has an incredibly efficient electoral machine, as I said at the very beginning, of converting seat, converting votes where they're needed into, um, into success. Um, they don't have the same ability to recruit new councillors to local government, which is often the, the training ground for effective politicians. And then finally, the other, the other threat for Welsh Labour is on the constitutional position. You know, let's not forget what Labour is a unionist party, admittedly, you know, a qualified unionist party, if you listen to Mark Drakeford's statements on the matter, but it's a unionist party that is going into a period of UK politics that would be framed by the issue of independence and national sovereignty. So it's got to get its own offer right on this, or it could hemorrhage younger voters, particularly to parties that have a much clearer line on, on that policy. So there's a follow up question there, which is a big one. But do you think this is from Hannah Watkin? Do you think it can now be argued that we're more likely to see a push towards more independent powers for Wales from a Welsh Labour government than we are to likely, than we are likely to ever affect applied government? To push for them and if this is the case where does that leave plied in future andy can i come to you on that one please yeah it's a, it's a really interesting one because it, there was a, a blog by um even morgan jones earlier this week that i think reflects some kind of discussions going on with implied at the moment about whether effectively they should kind of give up on the idea of ever forming a government and just treat themselves as a, as a think tank for labor i think is the, the phrase that was used and the probably quite fair observation from within Plaid that often they'll push for something and then a couple of years later it turns up in the Labour manifesto and I think the North Wales Medical Centre is an example of that. So I don't think that's, you know, you're never quite going to get Plaid admitting that that's what they're intending to do. But for anybody who kind of independence and more powers for Wales is what gets them out of bed in the morning, that is that is more likely than not to come through a Welsh Labour government. You know there is a fledgling indie for indie uh, Labour for indie Wales movement. Um, there's no sign yet of Plaid ever really kind of going beyond its its big base of support. So 
any move in the direction of more powers or indeed independence is is going to involve Welsh labour in, in in some way. So if if that's what kind of motivates you, it, it may be. And I say this as you know, I'm not a member of any political party, so not certainly not trying to recruit anybody. But it feels like that's that's where people who are pro independence, certainly in South Wales and North Wales, might want to focus their efforts in the long term. Laura. Yeah, I mean, I've always been of that opinion that um, if independence or a movement towards um, something resembling independence happens, it will happen through Welsh Labour than more likely than through Plaid Cymru. Um, I think in many respects, you know, we, we talked a lot about this before the election, assuming that one of the likely uh, uh, results would be a better vote for Plaid Cymru, better seat return for Plaid Cymru and a slightly less successful election for Labour. And there, I think we'd see we would have seen the seeds of um, that kind of alliance pushing for more powers. But it can still happen in many respects, even now, because you know Plaid Cymru has to find a role for itself in this Senedd. It's not the main opposition, but it's a significant group with a lot of new, fresh faces who want to make a mark. Um, and I think you know, bearing in mind the context for Welsh Labour, then it could be quite instrumental that Plaid Cymru is. Uh, for now, going back to its historic position, which is, you know, biting at the heels of Welsh Labour rather than usurping it and taking over government. But I have to say, you know, that strategy was never really going to happen in the short term. It, you know, the idea that Clyde would do an SNP and, and take over Scottish Labour uh, as the SNP has done and become the party of government, we, we just weren't in the same context, really. And so that was a, it was always naive to think that might happen. So there's a there's a question I'm going to jump to now because there's a good segue um, in term and it's coming from uh, Nick Speed, which is listening to the conversation. It feels like the next the biggest factor that will determine the next Senate election is what happens in Scotland and how parties respond to that. Is that fair? And I guess there's a little bit of there's a there's a kind of crunchy annoyingness about this, isn't there? When you know, Laura, you've talked about this being the first Welsh general election. And I know you've had, you know, you wondered if you overstated that a bit earlier in, in the in the week. I've listened to you so much, um, but um, you know, there is a sort of uh, well, we're watching Scotland, and we'll do something similar but different because it's Wales, and we'll do it, you know, a week or two later. There's a there's one of the points I've been making has been this is a very different election, different context in terms of media, different context in terms of the state of uh, the state of development. Of the conversation about 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 independence, Andy, can I can I come to you in terms of in terms of this? You know, is Scotland going to be the biggest factor in Wales's next election? Um, I mean, it's certainly going to be a, a major factor. Um, we, you know, we can see the the SNP and, and UK Conservatives kind of squaring up over the, the question of the legality of a you know a, a second referendum and how how that plays out. Obviously, is going to shape the kind of the. Because if a, if a referendum goes ahead and, and Scotland leaves the UK as as seems highly highly likely, then Wales finds itself in a position where it can either choose independence for itself or can effectively choose to be part of England, as as uh, you know, Sean from Yes Cymru's kind of put it in in the past. So that's obviously going to shape the election. It might make issues of independence kind of more more salient and and not. And obviously, uh, in, in terms of Mark Drakeford as a unionist. You know his his version of unionism is is very different to the to the current UK government's approach to kind of strengthening the union. Mark Drakeford is talking about federalism and respect, effectively a respect agenda and and close partnership working. But the the actions of the UK government are essentially they are to unionism what locking somebody in a cupboard is to romance. It's just we're not going to let you leave. We're going to stop you from leaving. And if if that if that fight in Scotland plays out in the way that it, it appears to be at the moment, it's going to be hugely damaging to that unionist agenda from the perspective of people in Wales and probably from people in England as well who have a lot of sympathy for the idea of Scottish independence or at the very least of their right to choose. So um, yes, is the short answer. Uh, I'm conscious of time. We've got we've got five minutes. Rossio, I want to come to you because one of the things that's been really, I think it's been really good over the last few months has been the diverse 50-50 campaign that you've been running with a, a number of other organizations. There's a question from Michael Whitaker, which is um, specifically for you. Are you able to say anything about neurodiversity as well? Because he was pointing out that 15 to 20% of the population are neurodiverse. 
is that part of that diversity uh, angle? Um, it, I think when we talk about diversity, we, you know, we in the diverse 5050 campaign and the partnership with WEN Wales and um, a few other organisations, it's we're very much looking at it intersectionally. So mm -hmm. we actively aspire to include and consider as many of the different um, types of diversity and protected characteristics as possible. Uh, I don't have specific knowledge about the, the, the view on neurodiversity, but I, I, I think that we, you know, we can't, oh, going forward, we can't only, any of us, we shouldn't only be talking about one type of diversity. We need to kind of always be thinking about the, the wider context and barriers that people encounter because of, you know, the different characteristics and identities that they embody. Um, can I just say something about really quickly about in the sure. independence movement? I just think that there is this growing question of should we Wales become more independent, you know, across the parties and particularly amongst young people, I think it's more of a burning question. But the question of um, can a Welsh ident independent identity be inclusive and embrace the, the diverse ethnic ethnicities that live in Wales is a really crucial one. And I don't think um, I think some of the parties have started to, to consider that, but not all of them. And I, I think it just needs to be really considered because we want, you know, while the independence, any movement towards independence and self-determination is, I think, an inherently positive thing, we need to also um, be careful about the, the dangers of increasing nationalism and populism and, and so on. So there's a really, really fine line to tread. Thank you for that. Um, there's a there's a question from Roisin Wilmot of RTPI about a training program for underrepresented groups. Would that be a positive long term way of setting them up in a strong position to enter politics and be elected? I know there's a mentoring scheme. And I'm assuming that that's going to carry on as well. Um, am I right, Rocio? That mentoring yeah, scheme. Yes, and actually the mentoring scheme um, will is it's about to enter a new phase where it will be intersectional and working in partnership with Disability Wales, Stonewall Cymru, and led by WEN Wales. So very much that cross equalities approach. But mentoring of potential candidates is really important, but equally as important is changing the system and the structure. Structural change. Yeah. It's sites. both and, isn't it? It's not either or. Um, Vivian's mentioned uh, that we haven't talked about the impact of Northern Ireland, how that might play out a uh, referendum on a united Ireland. That, I think, is a topic for another day, but one we'd certainly be interested in, in holding. I'm going to start wrapping us up. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining us today, everybody. I'd really like to thank our panellists for giving up your time. Professor Laura McAllister, Rosso Cifuentes and Andy Regan. We've been around as an organisation uh, since 1987. We were created in part to make the case for a devolved parliament in Wales. And we continue to work towards a stronger and more, democ uh, more confident democracy in our nation. As Andy said before, it doesn't mean just elections every five years. It means a more diverse and independent media rooted in Wales. And we've done a lot of work on that, on that recently in particular. Um, it means improving how our government and parliament engage with their counterparts in the other nations of the UK. And if you haven't read our uh, interparliamentary relations report written by an attendee uh, today, Professor Margaret Arden, I highly recommend it to you. It also means looking at how we can have a successful, clean, green and fair economy, one that enriches Wales's communities rather than extracting wealth from us. And it means in helping people understand the places that they live and having their voices heard in local decisions day in and day out. These are all things that we published on and talked on and influenced on over the last couple of years. The support of our members makes that work possible. So if you haven't joined yet, why not, is my question. A link is now going to come in the chat where you can do just that. It really does help. If you're not a member and have enjoyed today's discussion, please do consider donating to the IWA via our website. Your contributions help us make sure that our events are open and accessible to as many people as possible. You'll also have seen a short survey link in the chat. We'd really appreciate sharing your feedback on today's discussion to help us ensure that we can deliver even better events in the future. It'll only take a minute or so of your time. Our next event will be part of our Rethinking Wales serve, uh, series and will be held on the 27th of May. A couple of days before that, actually, we're going to be launching our Welsh Places Charter that we've done collaboratively with lots of other organisations, some of whom who are in the audience today as well. 
as Rossio so eloquently put it, I think the future is in partnerships and collaboration to make the change happen that we want to, to see. We really look forward to you joining us then. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Jochen Weil.